Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So I will start with uh, the speakers giving us 10-minute talks of what their work is about. And uh, during the transition period, you, we will take a question or two. But towards, after they're done with the slides, that's where we get to ask them a lot of questions. So uh, you can save your bigger questions for the end as well, because we will have time. So let me start with the first speaker. Our first speaker will be Ms. Sharon Kellett, who is the Director of Technology Policy in our group, and she is managing policy uh, aspects related to 5G and net neutrality uh, in the Mobility and Networking Group at Microsoft. So let me welcome Sharon here. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the afternoon session. <laughs> I, so last night at dinner, somebody asked me, what does the G stand for? Is it gravity? Is it gigabits? And I said, well, no, actually, it's generation. So 5G is about the fifth generation or the next generation, if you will, of mobile networks. And um, it, you know, most of us in this room would think of 5G as being the, what's the technology going to be? What's, you know, what's cool about the next uh, technology that's coming? And the people who are talking after me will address that wonderfully interesting issue. Uh, however, uh, I just want to point out that what technology gets actually built and deployed in the field is actually shaped by a lot more than just what's technically possible. It also, uh, the reason that companies, the mobile operators, will move to another generation of networks is uh, because they want to grow their businesses. And in order to grow their businesses, they're looking for new markets and new business models and new opportunities. And what they're allowed to do in that space and what spectrum, what wireless spectrum or frequency bands are going to be available to them to do that is heavily dependent on decisions that the government's going to make. So the first, and, and when we say the government, it's not a one government, it's governments all over the world, and sometimes it's not even governments acting alone but in concert, and so we'll talk about that. Uh, the first question is, uh, will new spectrum be available for 5G, and if so, when? And the answer to the first question is maybe maybe new spectrum will be available. And the second question is when, to when is in a long time. <laughs> Not anytime super soon, okay? And to understand why that's true, I've given you just a really quick primer on what the process looks like for spectrum to become available. There are two steps to getting spectrum into somebody's hands. Uh, the first step is called allocation. That's about uh, a, a, a global harmonization of what particular spectrum bands can be used for. So. Does this particular band at this particular frequencies get used for satellites? Does it get used for mobile phones? Does it get used for the Navy? That's allocation. And um, the ITU, which is the in, an international organization, intergovernmental organization, uh, is the agency there, or uh, I guess it's part of the United Nations. Uh, they're the agency that harmonizes frequency allocations worldwide. And everybody would like 5G spectrum to be harmonized worldwide if they could get that, because it would be much easier to manufacture equipment to one set of bands rather than 40 sets of bands, which is how it was done in 4G. Um, so uh, it would be great if they were harmonized. We'll see how close they can get. Um, beyond, our, and, and by the way, in the ITU speak, their word for 5G is IMT 2020. Uh, 5G is a little easier to say, I think. Um, the, uh, when, when the ITU gets done with their work, then the national governments say, okay, well, you want to use that band for cellular? All right, now let's decide who actually gets use of that band in our country and by what process. Do we auction the spectrum? Do we give it away? Uh, those kinds of decisions. That process is called assignment, and, uh, and um, each national government can do it differently for the same set of bands. And that process takes a very long time. <laughs> it's typically about five to 10 year process to get any new spectrum into the market. Uh, part of why it all takes so long is that um, the uh, ITU's processes were developed in an era that where time moved a little more slowly, I think, than it does today. I think the T, Paul would know for sure, 
the original T would have been telegraph in 1865, is that right? Yes, right. So give you an idea, this, the time frame that the world was moving at was a little slower back then. Uh, in any case, they, in their current world, they run uh, something called a World Radio Congress. Yeah, people in the know refer to it as a work. To me, that sounds like something out of a Tolkien novel, but I'm um, leaving that aside. Uh, the work is held every three to four years, and the works are where spectrum uh, allocation decisions are, are made. Uh, there's one coming up this November. We actually have uh, at least one person going to it uh, in, in November, probably more. Uh, and in fact, he's not here today because he's in Bucharest, Romania, getting ready for it. Um, but what the WARC 15 will be doing is looking for frequency bands that could be used for IMT 2020, otherwise known as 5G. Uh, it's viewed as highly unlikely that any bands below 6 gigahertz will actually be identified in November, but more likely that uh, bands higher than 6 gigahertz um, will be put on an agenda for study. And um, what that means is that sometime by uh, work 19, which is the next one in 2019, will um, will uh, will uh, could could possibly become devoted to 5G at that time. A different aspect of policy that affects what uh, what providers can do is how how incentivized they are to, uh, to deploy new technology. Do they have a strong incentive to beat their competitors, or do they not have any competitors? So uh, that will be determined by regulators who determine who's allowed to merge with whom, uh, and, um, and whether uh, a third party can come along and use the network to build some kind of innovative model on top of somebody else's facilities. So an example, the first case of, of a, what we call a horizontal merger, two networks merging with each other, uh, in the U.S. a few years ago, AT&T wanted to acquire T-Mobile. T-Mobile is known as the innovative or disruptive network operator. Um, both the Justice Department and the FCC at the time said, no, you can't do that. Uh, it's bad competition policy. We're going to leave T-Mobile out there to, to keep being a thorn in your side um, and you know, innovating and being an uncarrier and all that jazz. Uh, so that's an example where, uh, you know, depending on exactly what kind of mergers are or are not allowed, uh, there will be different levels of pressure on incumbents to try to differentiate their networks with new technology. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the word MVNO? Most of you know the term. Okay, good. Um, so uh, essentially an MVNO is a reseller, right? They're buying the capacity on a facilities-based carriers network and offering it in a different package to customers. And uh, one of those uh, models that's out there today is one called Wi-Fi First. The idea being that uh, instead of you buy a package from the cellular company and then you add Wi-Fi to it for your high bandwidth needs, rather you buy a package from a company like Republic Wireless or uh, you know, uh, Google Fi is, is an example of this. You use Wi-Fi for most of your needs and when you get out of Wi-Fi coverage, uh, the MVNO agreement kicks in and you end up using the uh, capacity from a traditional cellular carrier. And so uh, one of the questions that competition policy deals with is, okay, so are those arrangements regulated or are those arrangements privately negotiated? And if they're privately negotiated as they are in the US, where are the limits of those? Uh, and an associated issue, uh, one of the things that's cropped up, and this is not so much about 5G, but more about you know, ways in which technology is actually changing that might shape 5G, um, a new, a new technology has emerged, which is to aggregate licensed and unlicensed spectrum into a single use, uh, and the generic name for this is LTE over unlicensed bands. Um, and the basic idea is illustrated in the picture. A licensed carrier takes their uh, licensed channel, uses it as a control channel, bonds it with the unlicensed, the five gigahertz in particular, Wi-Fi spectrum, and, uh, and aggregates it into something that the carrier can use. And there's big, big, big questions about what that's gonna do to Wi-Fi performance. And there isn't one answer to that question because there's at least four different variants that I've counted so far of, of ways to do LTE over unlicensed, and they have widely different competitive profiles. So some of them might coexist fairly with the Wi-Fi, some of them might not. Uh, and so this is an area where spectrum policy and competition policy are kind of merged into one big question and uh, regulated. This is one where, up to this point, I've talked about ways policy is going to shape the technology. I think this is one 
where technology is going to push the policymakers to have to make some decisions about what it really means to have rules about unlicensed spectrum. I'll conclude with some thoughts about network neutrality. Is there anyone in this room who has not heard of net neutrality? Okay, so <laughs> I figure you've heard of it. Um, the question is, what effect does it have on 5G? And um, the gist of, the, of net neutrality is that, um, that uh, the internet is you know, a bunch of applications, services, content, and so on that's available through a network, and how much control does the network operator allowed to have over uh, what the user experiences in terms of the applications and uh, services and content. And um, what, um, what uh, the, the U.S. adopted a new set of rules in the end of February in the EU, literally this morning, the text came out of what it is they're uh, about to formalize in the EU. Uh, and the gist of what they have done is as follows. Uh, they've defined two different things. One is an open internet, and the other is something else, which they go by the name of specialized services. So internet access is a service where the ISP is very limited in terms of what they are allowed to, uh, to do. Um, they're not allowed to block or throttle and generally, it's an economic. There, there, there's both political and economic reasons why they might do that. Uh, they might do it politically because they don't like what a speaker has to say, so they would block that content. They might do it economically because they would like the speaker to have to pay them in order to transmit that content. And that is what uh, that's called th blocking, throttling, or requiring pay for priority. And that's what net neutrality says can't happen on your internet access pipe. But what about the other pieces of your pipe? You have a network, it goes to your house or to your office, and uh, what else can you do with it besides access the internet? So uh, do any of you get voice from your cable company, for example? You get telephone service from your cable company? No one in the room does? <laughs> wow, okay. Um, okay, well, if you did, the FCC would consider that a, uh, a, a what they call a specialized service. In other words, it's not something you're using to reach the entire internet. Um, and so they have carved that out and said, okay, those are different. That's not the same as internet access and net neutrality rules don't apply. Um, in the interest of time, I'll set aside zero rate and come back to it if you have questions. Um, the reason this relates to 5G is that the business models for 5G are very much all about finding new revenue opportunities for mobile operators. And in order to do that, there's two ways you can do that. You can offer the services yourself and not allow third parties to offer them. Or you can say to the third party, you know what, I want you to be able to offer that service, but I also want you to have to pay me to get better quality out of my network for it. And, uh, and so there's an open question as to whether those models will be considered specialized services or whether those models will be considered open internet access. And I think that's going to be a tussle that we're going to be watching playing out over, over the next uh, few years as 5G develops. And often there are numerous scenarios that, that are tossed out, like connected cars, for example, that you know, it, it must be offered by the operator. And you know, we'll see, uh, to, to be determined. Um, how much time do I have left? Zero. Okay, then I won't tell you about zero rating. I'll leave it for the questions. And if you have questions about it, I'm happy to explain what that issue is all about. Thanks. Thanks, Sharon. Hopefully you now know that 5G will not only be about what technology is feasible, but also about how the network operators can maximize revenue and how what applications can you make possible? So to hear about what applications can you make feasible with uh, 5G, we will have here Sandeep Rangan. He's from NYU, and he has a lot of industry experience as well. He co-founded Flarion Technologies, which was a spin-off of Bell Labs. And he has also worked at Qualcomm, where he was the director of engineering for the OFDM uh, infrastructure products. So I will give it to Sandeep. All right, thanks, Kantka. Um, one thing I'm actually not going to talk about is what you can do with 5G. That's, uh, that's one of my questions at the end, but um, maybe I'll try to say what, uh, what maybe one way you can create uh, 5G to work. So. Oh, it comes out in blue. 
All right. Um, well, okay, I'd like to thank everyone for giving me a chance to uh, speak at this uh, panel. There are actually going to be a couple of other speakers talking about millimeter wave. What I wanted to do uh, in this talk is really talk about it specifically in the context of cellular, which is a relatively new concept, and I'll show you why that is new but also relatively exciting. So how do I get this to move? Does this... Go ahead. It doesn't seem to. Technology. Yeah. Yeah, maybe you should just do it manually? Oh. It, 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 you want to do it? Okay, yeah. Um, just, uh, I, the, I'm going to talk about some of the um, work with uh, uh, that I've done, but also just work generally done at the NYU Wireless Center. One person I want to point out in particular is Ted Rappaport, who's sometimes called the uh, father, the messiah of millimeter wave. Um, he's, as maybe some people know, he's rather sick right now, and we're all hoping he can get better. And Elsa Erkip, who's also a faculty member. All right, um, just to put, before I talk about millimeter wave, let me just talk about 5G in general, or specifically 5G cellular and what people are trying to achieve by this. This comes from Nokia, but you'll see kind of a similar set of requirements for most of the uh, vendors. And if you look at that set of lists, it's really daunting the kind of things that people are looking at, orders of magnitude, increases in data rate, and reductions in latency. What's important to understand is that when you're looking at 5G, it has many requirements, but not all of these requirements have to be met at the same time or delivered by the same technology. And millimeter wave is really trying to emphasize just a couple of these things. And those are those orders of magnitude increases in um, data rate as well as this reduction in latency down to about, say, about one millisecond, which is about an order of magnitude less than it is. On the other hand, there are other things like much lower, battery, much greater battery life, and those would obviously have to be addressed by other types of technologies. All right, so what is millimeter wave? So millimeter wave, uh, millimeter refers to the wavelength, and if you look at what one um, millimeter to 10 millimeters, that corresponds to about frequencies in the neighborhood of 30 to 300 gigahertz. And why are they interested in this? Well, this uh, the best way to look at it is through this figure, which really comes out from the seminal paper. If you really want to learn more about this, I'd start with this paper from Samsung. And if you look at here on the uh, left, all cellular communications right now, commercial, occurs in that tiny band in that black below three gigahertz. Now, this is becoming extremely congested as networks try to expand capacity. How congested is right now? Just to give you an example, the last speaker was talking about uh, spectrum auctions. They recently tried to auction off the, what's called the AWS uh, spectrum, and just 60 megahertz in that bandwidth went for a record breaking, I think, like $46 billion. So you can see how just prohibitively expensive it is to try to increase capacity in this band. Millimeter wave, just is to scale, is all that space there. Like maybe, and that's how much more space is that if, uh, well, immediately in the short term, there are probably bands in about the 28 gigahertz range, the 70 gigahertz range. And if you look, uh, uh, that may be about, uh, if you look going forward, maybe up to 100, maybe even 200 times more spectrum is available. On top of that spectrum uh, is that you can make uh, an, um, arrays with many, many antenna elements in the same, in, the, for, in a very small space. And that, what me, that means is that you can get what are called very high numbers of spatial degrees of freedom. You can transmit in many directions at a time. So when you put these two together, you're talking about uh, networks within capacities, maybe 100, maybe even 1,000 times more capacity than what you have today. Now, how big is that? Well, if you look at it in comparison in the cellular world where I've worked in, some, if you look at a comparative technology, say like MIMO, which was one of the biggest inventions that came out in the mid, beginning of the mid-90s, took about 10 years really to get fully through the system, the kind of grain you got was about maybe 60%. 60% greater capacity per base station, when you actually look at the realistic implementations. Here you have a technology that's possibly orders of magnitude. This kind of change is really revolutionary. It just does not occur that often. Another way to look at it is the following. Um, almost every aspect, oh, just go back, sorry. Um, uh, almost every aspect of technology has, uh, of mobile technology has increased in orders of magnitude, whether you're looking at the processor speed, the memory, the storage. On the other hand, the spectrum that 
we've been looking at is really the same as what were networks were back in the GSM era 20, 30 years ago. And so it's really right right now to try to look at technology that can push out into these higher bands. Okay, let's go. That being said, the, there's enormous potential, but there are very serious challenges. If you look back at papers, even just five years ago, they will say millimeter wave is great for A, B, and C, but it can never, of course, be used for mobile cellular. Why not? Well, there's two main reasons. The first is um, that the transmissions that are fundamentally limited in terms of um, of propagation. For technically, I don't want to go over here because I only have 10 minutes. But there, you can kind of you can overcome that. But what you have to do is transmit in highly directional uh, beams. Now that makes it very difficult potentially in a cellular environment where objects are moving. That means you'll need to track them and also search and also for control and other things. But the bigger problem with it is what's called shadowing. One of the great things about uh, cellular frequencies today is that they can propagate. You can most of you, if you have your cell phone on you, you can see that you can get a signal inside a building like this. In millimeter wave, that becomes very difficult. A lot of um, basic materials, particular materials where they have a lot of water, can absorb the uh, signals. And even the, something like the human body can absorb the signal, uh, can uh, block the signal. That means that if you turn your uh, uh, turn your body, that signal can get blocked from the base station. So these are uh, fundamental problems. On the other hand, these materials also provide lots of reflecting paths, and we'll see that it might be possible to get a signal. All right, next one, next slide. I see you're having to both. So when we're thinking about uh, millimeter wave cellular, what we're thinking about are a few things. First of all, smalls that are small, maybe in the order of about 100, 200 meters. That's actually about the same size, though, as current urban microcellular deployments. So it's still not necessarily a greater increase in density. On the other hand, we're looking at very narrow beams that are constantly searching around to the users. And you may also try to do some kind of range extension by doing some kind of relaying or multi-hop. Uh, um, so all those, those are sort of three elements that you should think of when you think of what way people are thinking about for millimeter cellular. All right, so can these work? Well, like I said, a few years ago, before if you asked someone in the business, they would have said it would never been possible. So Ted Rappaport, who was uh, to been working in this area for you know, 20 years, he had joined NYU, our school, and one of the things he did was the uh, following. Just to test it out, if you might recognize, that's uh, the Washington Square campus in the village in New York City. And so this is an extremely dense uh, uh, area of buildings. If it could work in New York, it could work anywhere because this is um, uh, one of the most uh, difficult environments to get a line of sight connection. So he placed um, cells on tops of buildings on those yellow stars. And then he went around, or his students went around in the hot sun, and tried to see where they could get a signal. And look at where he could get a signal. This is, we get the signal all the way at the green dots. So look at that signal way up, for example, on that top dot. There is no line of sight connection. What's a line of sight connection? That means that you can see the transmitter. Well, you definitely cannot treat. That's two blocks in New York City with many, many buildings in between it. And yet, you could see that. Now, you're thinking, well, how is that on Earth possible? I told you it can never go through buildings. Well, it finds reflecting paths. And this was a remarkable finding. And it meant that this could, even though millimeter wave signals get blocked, a lot of these building materials are highly reflective. And that eventually, you could find a path and in fact, you could make some spatial measurements, not only find one, but maybe up to, on average, about two or three paths on to most receiver locations. And this suggested that millimeter wave signals would actually be possible, millimeter transmitters would be actually be possible in these uh, networks. All right, uh, this is too technical. Let's skip it. I don't want to get down. All right, so we took these... Um, measurements that from Ted Rapports and said, well, okay, well, that maybe that you could say, well, you saw a signal, that doesn't necessarily mean much. How much more capacity could you actually get? Well, there's a standard methodology for anyone who's worked in the cellular business. Once you have some sort of statistical channel model based on these measurements, you can try to predict how well the capacity is. So we did the following. We just turned that crank, looking at these channel models, and made a com simple comparison. Let's look at a comparison of a one potential one gig gigahertz system in the LMDS band, that's uh, 28 gigahertz. And uh, so one gigahertz is very easy to get in this band because this is actually, uh, that's, that's not a large bandwidth in that place. And compared it to the widest bandwidth single carrier um, LTE system, which is a 20 megahertz uplink and 20 megahertz downlink. So about 25 times more bandwidth. And then you look at the total gain, you uh, run this number. And according to that simulation, if, this, if these channel models are correct, then you could get about a 25 times gain 
of that. That is just enormous. Now, and on top of that, even the edge of cell users, those are kind of the worst users, what you think would really suffer in a millimeter wave system, get about a 10 times gain. Now, on top of that, this is looking at a very bare bones um, millimeter wave system without any bells and whistles. On the other hand, the LTE numbers, for those who know the standards, where you get that from, is that the vendors, when they try to introduce technologies, they put in their best, most sophisticated system with all the best bells and whistles like SDMA and uh, you know, very sophisticated intercell interference coordination, and they put their, those in. And even then, we're beating it by this 25x number. Clearly, we could even do larger. So this is some validation that it's maybe possible to get an extremely high bandwidth um, wide area network. All right. All right, um, we can talk much more about the details of this, but I just wanted to leave it for this audience because I know this audience is more, I'm more of a physical layer person, but up to a higher layer to try to just put out a couple of questions that maybe we can uh, get to in the panel discussion. The first is, even if this technology is possible, what kind of apps will actually drive that? And I, I, that's not, I don't believe, disbelieve that these kind of higher data rates or much lower latencies can get used. But I think if we get some understanding of that, um, that might be able to help better understand how these networks will be used and how we need to design them. The, um, the other uh, part is, what will really drive, in particular, the very low latency, and also, um, which is one of the dominant requirements, and we saw that from the previous talk, and that will also require sort of fundamental changes in the network infrastructure as well. And that, for example, that will require, you know, even if we got the network latency, the air link latency down to one millisecond to take advantage of that, we'll need to start pushing content much closer to the edge of the network. And that will also require change, fundamental changes in the way that the uh, network infrastructure is um, and worked out. And I want to maybe uh, speculate on, uh, maybe we can come to that in the panel discussion as well about uh, um, how that, the implications of that. All right, thanks. Thank you, Sandeep. That was a great uh, starting point of what capacities are possible with, uh, we can take a question here while I switch the slides. Victor, go ahead. Hi, I'm sort of curious about a couple of things. First, why did you call the 2011 as a seminal paper and the, of the Samsung, especially because the notion of reflections is known for a long time. In fact, it was a Samsung CEO in 2010 CES who demonstrated that you could, using Psybeam, Psybeam's uh, equipment, you could actually send a beam and have uh, human beings walk around and they would reflect off of the different services and still get it. So this has been known for, for ages. And the second thing is, I think the issue is the last uh, particular uh, slide that he put, which is that it's not that people don't understand the technology and they don't understand what the coverage patterns is. It is really uh, economics. Who's, what's going to drive the cost to create the cells? So um, I sort of want to know why, I mean, you know, what are your thoughts on the fact that people have sort of kind of, I think, known about a lot of these issues? For oh, yeah, yeah, okay. So first of all, yeah, it's a good point. So first of all, the um, millimeter wave propagation has been well known. And of course, the reflective properties of millimeter wave systems on, particularly on indoors, has been measured since the, me measured since the, since the 70s. What I think that paper was, and maybe there was, maybe it was, I, in my view, the first that really looked at it comprehensively for an out wide area cellular network. And that was what, uh, that was why it was so uh, interesting. People, of course, already by that time were, uh, you know, well into looking at wi wireless LANs and other sort of more short range technologies. On the question of the economics, I think that's the, you know, that's the million dollar question. And that isn't specific to millimeter wave, but to a lot of 5G technologies of what's going to be the driving need for operators to, who've invested you know, billions of dollars on 4G to try to upgrade that. Now, they already think 4G itself can expand, you know, just by regular evolution. And so it'll have to be something that's going to, you know, looking maybe in the 21, 2021 timeframe of something that will really motivate these kind of data rates. So I think that's an excellent question. I don't think that's known. Thanks, Sandeep, and thanks, Victor, for the question. Next up, we have Shinyu Zhang. Uh, he's a professor at University of Wisconsin-Madison, and uh, he has a great set of achievements behind him uh, already. Uh, he has an ACM uh, Mobicom Best Paper Award, NSF Career Award, and uh, I'm sure he'll win many more. But today he will talk to us about um, 
indoor communications with millimeter wave and what's possible and what he has seen in these um, regime. Thank you, Akisha. Um, there are many definitions of 5G at this time. People don't really know what exactly is 5G, I think. So it's a good time to talk something random about 5G, I think. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is the concept of unifying 5G millimeter wave communication and sensing. Um, first, uh, some, first of all, some background about uh, millimeter wave networking. Uh, this uh, millimeter wave networks, uh, they have a great potential and have some unique features compared with what we are using on the cellular band. Currently, the spectrum on the cellular band is only 1.3 gigahertz in total. Uh, among 2G, 3G, and 4G. But for millimeter wave, we have sufficient spectrum. Even for unlicensed, we have uh, 7 gigahertz. And there are some light licensed, uh, 13 gigahertz, and uh, some uh, licensed, but uh, potentially can be unlicensed. Uh, a lot of spectrums, uh, they're uh, available for us to use. And with such spectrum, we can achieve very high bitrate communications, up to multiple giga BPS. Because of this, many new applications can be enabled, for example, uh, in door, in home, in store, or in flight, media distribution, high stream uncompressed video distribution, to support uh, uh, mirror card, uh, wireless virtual reality, and uh, mobile to kiosk uh, file sync. On the other hand, we can also realize short range, high speed communications for, for example, in between base stations in the 5G uh, cellular band, um, and also in between the base stations and the mobile handset for very short range, small cell or pico cell networks. These are just some communication applications, but we can also have uh, some mobile sensing applications based on millimeter wave. For example, recently Google released this uh, project Soli, which is a 60 gigahertz millimeter wave chipset that can recognize a set of gestures and our group had a more ambitious project which can recognize, which can check pen movement to realize uh, wireless transcription using 60 gigahertz radio. This paper will be published uh, in ACM Mobilecom this year. So because of these two lines of applications, communication and sensing, what I was thinking about is we can actually unify this uh, communication and sensing in the 5G millimeter wave networks. By unification, uh, I mean two aspects. First of all, we can directly use the communication interface on the 5G millimeter wave radios to realize some interesting mobile sensing applications like the project Soli that I mentioned. And also, we can use the sensing function to help communication or networking. Uh, the first aspect, actually many people are doing it uh, on the Wi-Fi domain. So today I will mainly talk about the second aspect, that is using the sensing function to facilitate 5G millimeter wave networking. So uh, one of the major concerns about millimeter wave networking is the propagation loss. All, all things equal, the propagation loss at 60 gigahertz is about 30 dB higher compared with Wi-Fi. So many people are thinking about using highly directional radios to concentrate the signals to overcome the propagation loss. However, this will introduce more challenges. For example, the radios become highly vulnerable to uh, blockage and device motion. Uh, on the other hand, people are thinking about using a unique device feature to overcome such challenges. That is, we can use very small form factor phase array to generate highly directional beams and steer the beams to overcome the uh, device motion or human blockage. Uh, recently, we did some experiments to test this kind of uh, flexible beam uh, communications for 60 hertz millimeter wave communications. But what we found is that this is not necessarily working well. And whether it works or not is highly dependent on environmental context. In some kind of situations, uh, the, the uh, beam steering may work. In some, kind of, some other kind of uh, situations, it's simply adapting the beam width will work. And uh, whether it will work will also depend on whether there's uh, reflectors and the reflector positions and uh, where the human blockage is happening, all such environmental and context factors. So we were thinking about whether we can learn such environmental, environmental context in order to help 
network level management and protocol level adaptation. So uh, this, uh, the answer is actually an easy yes, because millimeter wave radios is born to be a highly sensitive sensor to sense the context. In the millimeter wave radar domain, people have some fundamental laws. They are saying that uh, the sensitivity of a radio is proportional to the wavelength. So at millimeter wave, the wavelength is only a few millimeters, much, much shorter compared with the microwave band. So millimeter wave radios can naturally become highly sensitive sensors for environmental context. Some examples of uh, how we can take advantage of the sensing functionality to help network and protocol design. This example shows how we can learn the environment in a way similar to uh, room acoustics in order to understand how to place the 60 hertz millimeter wave radios to improve its coverage. In room acoustics, people have learned how to reshape the room in order to make the sounding effect better. Similarly, in a millimeter wave radio environment, we can also learn how the environment looks like and uh, which uh, kind of uh, placement of the access point can help us improve the radio coverage. This, of course, requires the radios themselves to be cognitive and to sense the environment in a way similar to radar in order to understand the environment and help the net network adaptation. Another example, we usually have a lot of beam directions when we use a phase array antenna to realize the flexible beam communications. Adapting to different directions involves a lot of overhead but there's some correlation between all those directions and we can learn the correlation as long as we know the environment very well. So we can again take advantage of the sensing function in 60 gigahertz radios to learn the environment and to learn the correlation between beams and adapt in a more intelligent way to reduce the network level overhead. In order to realize all these ideas, a unification of uh, communication and sensing ideas, we need to do a lot of uh, experimental verification. We can no longer do simulation because all these things, this sensing, this environment, and the human activities, they are non-stationary. We cannot profile them using models or using statistics. So we, we need to have a real test bed. Um, many people are concerned about the lack of test bed in 60 years, and actually this has been a barrier for the millimeter wave research. So recently our group built this uh, WIMI, Wisconsin Millimeter Wave Software Radio, which is a programmable transmitter and a receiver, and also a programmable millimeter, uh, 60 hertz radar that can be used to realize sensing and imaging functions. This, uh, this programmable system contains a 60 hertz antenna set that can be changed and steered mechanically. And it has a baseband processor with about 245 megahertz of sampling rate. And its RF front end is also programmable in terms of the output power level and also the uh, bandwidth, analog bandwidth. This is the uh, software radio platform supported by the NSF CRI program and will be released as open source uh, firmware and hardware together. Uh, it's a bit expensive. Uh, it, although it is, it's open source, we just have to make sure we have sufficient money to, to use it. And we are also going to build a second version with much more powerful capabilities like uh, ultra wideband and the programmable phased array antenna as well as uh, MIMO functionalities. So in summary, I have uh, talked about uh, the, uh, some uh, pot uh, potential of uh, millimeter wave communications for the 60 hertz, uh, especially the 60 hertz millimeter wave communications. And uh, I talked about why we need to unify this um, communication and sensing at the millimeter wave domain and uh, uh, why we can do it. Um, so that's it. Thank you. Do we have a question for Shinyu right now? I have a quick question. He talked about spatial correlation. If I want to place multiple su such devices indoors, uh, what, what do we learn based on your work? How do we handle MIMO indoors? Uh, spatial. So there's spatial correlation. Spatial correlation will definitely affect the MIMO performance uh, because we know that MIMO gain is dependent on the matrix, channel matrix rank. 
so we can easily learn about spatial correlation as long as we can probe the channel. And the spatial uh, correlation, again, is dependent on environment. For example, if the, uh, all the radios are in line of sight, of course, the correlation is high. And even in non-live sight, we can learn about that, uh, the spatial correlation by scanning the channel. So that's a very easy thing, actually, based on if we can sense the, if we can sense the channel matrix. OK, thank you. Uh, go ahead, Victor. Very quick question with your test bed. What is the range that you have seen in your test bed? Uh, right now, we, have, we haven't done an extreme test yet. Right now, what, and the maximum range we tested is seven meters. Of course, it depends on the modulation we used and also the uh, so what environment. Do you th what, what do you think is happening with the NYU um, test bed? Uh, NYU test bed is using a different RF front end and also a different baseband processor and different antennas. I think uh, with that test bed set up, it's very easy to achieve 100 meter range because uh, they are using the slide uh, correlator. It's essentially a high performance channel sounder. It will definitely have better range than ours. But our objective is not coverage. Our objective is uh, programmability, flexibility. I was wondering about your antenna and RF front end. Did you build that yourself, or? No, we are just engineers assembling other people's thing together. Uh, the RF front end was uh, purchased from a startup company, and baseband is essentially just an FPGA, and uh, there's high-speed ADDA. We are just uh, uh, putting all of them together and uh, build the bridging hardware and also the firmware driver, firmware drivers. Right, uh, no, not antenna. The RF front end means the frequency up converter and down converters. The antennas uh, can be purchased from many companies, actually. Thanks, Xinyu. Um, next up, we'll have Heather. Um, and she, will, uh, she is uh, currently an associate professor at UC Santa Barbara, uh, where she leads the Link Lab as part of the Next Generation Networking Group. She has a lot of industry research experience, including uh, at Microsoft Research Asia. And she has gotten many awards. Uh, I have a long list here, but the one I will mention is that her work has been featured in MIT Technology Review. And she's gotten Bell Labs President's Gold Award, and so on. So without further ado, I'll let her talk about her work. And she has actually tried deploying outdoor Pico cells with uh, 60 gigahertz work. Okay. Um, great. Um, so by now, you actually learned a lot about millimeter wave. So what I'm going to do is trying to focus more on 60 gigahertz, because I think that's a particular sweet spot um, for economics, like answering, trying to answer Victor's earlier question. So 60 gigahertz is um, has a very large chunk of unlicensed spectrum. So we kind of get rid of the light the licensing and the policy issues. It's a very high frequency, millimeter wave frequency, so you can have very large compressed arrays, and that creates highly directional beams. You can concentrate the I mean, significant amount of energy and also reduce a lot of interference, and this will be very useful for our five or future networking design. And the last one is that, oops, this one's too sensitive, it's leveraging Existing standards, there are already 811 AD, so you already have the standard issue, I mean, solved. And today, we're already seeing these products, I mean, on the market, right? So um, Dell used to have a laptop with a docking station, which the chipset cost 37, I mean, dollar. IBM, um, um, actually HP just released another one with Intel chipset with similar cost. I've seen startups saying that their chip actually costs five dollar each. So this will be integrated like, into old future smartphones as part of the Wi-Fi, which means that we solve the standard, the protocol, some kind of standardization, and the uh, license issues. Okay. So 60 gigahertz today being widely used for indoor, Y gig, all these different um, 
uh, technologies and some of the outdoor in terms of stationary network. So what we're thinking is slightly different matter. What if we take 60 gigahertz outdoor as a solar, part of solar networks? Think about the following scenario. I have LTE which provide me the availability, availability, just connectivity for your connection. And then I also have some kind of 60 gigahertz base stations overlay small pico cells, which provide high capacity when you need it. So considering the following, where you have a base station, and each base station will have multiple antenna arrays. Each array will target one particular user. So this way, each base station can cover multiple, many users simultaneously. And because of the interference issue is kind of solved by the directionality of the transmission, these base station or the pico cell can overlap significantly and that provides high density coverage and high capacity and also availability for some of the users. So think about the following real life examples. Consider this is a New York City street. Um, you have lampposts. We can potentially put those space station on top of the lamppost over here so you have power or you can use you know, uh, solar. And you can basically use these to serve the users underneath. The street, as Sandeep says, the street and all these buildings provide perfect reflectors and allow you to connect users even when their position is not correctly facing the base station. So these give you significant amount of advantage. So why 60 gigahertz? Okay, if you look at from the capacity point of view, the spectrum is significant. You have high bandwidth. The um, array gives you significant amount of spatial diversity. So you can basically spatial multiplexing a lot of users using arrays of subarrays, like I just mentioned. And finally, these very narrow beams allow you to significantly minimize interference, allow the dense cell to be deployed. So we've actually looked at some calculations and we find out that if you can overlay all these cells every 20 meters, they should not interfere significantly with each other. So this means that you can really significantly increase your capacity in all three important dimensions. So if you say, oh, this seems pretty good, but a lot of people are very concerned about this. Why would I want to use a 60 gigahertz? There are papers or there are articles talk about we don't want to use 60 gigahertz because the oxygen absorption I mean, peak at this kind of frequency. So the first thing people are thinking is, Maybe the range is too small. That's why you're using it indoor, right? So what we did is we actually set up a um, test bed, 60 gigahertz test bed using the off-shelf uh, velocity chipsets, and we kind of measured, you know, all these um, ranges and other different questions. What we found of in I mean, interesting things. The first thing is that the range can actually be more than 100 meter depending on your hardware device, right? So today, Velocity the chipset, the $37 chipset, is designed for indoor, can also already give you 27 me 23 meters at a 300 megabits per second. And if you can actually improve your end array by a little bit, you can potentially achieve more than 100 meter in range. The second thing is, you know, if you work at a high frequency, you must be very sensitive to blockage. Yes, but 60 gigahertz also have very nice reflection properties. It pretty much can re reflect different kind of materials, see it on the street and in outdoor environment and even indoor environment. So your reflection through all these different material provides you ample of, um, alternative passes, give you enough connectivity opportunities. And also, as user move, you could just realign the antenna with each other. And we found that if you just realign every two seconds, for pedestrian, that's more than enough. And in fact, if you look at today's velocity, which is designed for indoor scenario, can already support some interest, I mean, moderate pedestrian speed. So this means that some simple feasibility study tells us 60 gigahertz can be utilized in outdoor pico cell scenario, give you 100 meter coverage, and yet adapt to user mobility as well as blockage. We actually tested when the pedestrian walk in front of you, they did block 
your transmission, but the reflection or the base station diversity, I mean, coming from another base station signal can easily recover that. So if you're moving forward, the key challenge of real life is, is how do you do network design? I think that's an interesting part of it. First of all is, how do you track each user? Now I can dedicate part of the array for each particular user. How do you track this user over time so you can keep a rich past inventory about them? And in, you can certainly just periodically scan each particular user, but maybe there are much more interesting or efficient algorithm. For example, we're developing something called compressive array adaptation at UCSB to address this problem. And the second one is called Pickle Cloud Architecture. We found from our experiment that if you two base station or multiple base station can collaborate it and serve a certain single user, you can provide ample connectivity opportunity for the users. But how do you, you know, let the space station coordinate? You are essentially forming a little cloud around each user, but how does this cloud work with each other? Especially if you have a very high data rate in the data plan, how do you build a control plan to basically allow them to coordinate? And finally, it comes to this really basic fundamental question is we really need some hardware we can test the network protocol designs or algorithm designs. These days, you don't, we don't have a you know, programmable antenna array. A lot of research we're using horn antennas, including our research, and some of the existing antenna arrays, they do not open up their interface to us. So we, believe, we think that this is an important step for the network researcher to overcome in order to moving forward in these 60 gigahertz or even millimeter wave networking area. Uh, we're actually uh, ongoing work at UCSB and Stanford and with Xin Yu at Wisconsin, we're trying to develop a programmable antenna array which we can hopefully open source to the general public. That's our ongoing work, that's it. Okay, so I, I also want to mention that <sighs> Like Xin Yu mentioned as well, we also have something that interesting here is if we use radios just not for purely for networking, we can also use it for more interesting application. For example, think about these, uh, these Amazon or whatever drones you're flying. You can use a 60 gigahertz radio when they're not needed for the communication to sense the environment. We have a paper coming up that basically can scan the objects and then identify the shape, the material, and the location of the object so that these drones can easily pick up the object on the fly. So you can actually utilize the network radio not only for communication, but for sensing and other interesting applications. Okay, so by that, let me uh, conclude the talk. And these are basically our envision architecture for the CC Gigahertz Pico cell. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Heather. Uh, was there a question right now, or we can ask questions for all the panelists at this point? Do we have a question? Uh, go ahead, Elizabeth. Um, hi, so you mentioned that the, um, even though you're using narrow beams, it's acceptable for moderate walking with a realignment about every two seconds. But what about all the other types of movement that you would wanna cover when you're outside, bikes, skateboards, and then cars? <laughs> Good question. So the thing is, for vehicle, that's a very different story because you have to really follow the user really fast. By that, you can actually make a compromise. If you widen the beam, then the coverage of the beam is, is larger, and then you can follow the user faster. But by doing that, you also reduce the strength of the signal. That means the range will be reduced. But doing, but so the thing is, the nice thing for that is for um, CC gigahertz, FCC just increased the EARP by 30 dB. So you can actually boost significantly power from the base station to track users. And if you also use very powerful antenna, for example, like the 10 by 10 antenna at the array, at the user, you can still enhance or overcome this loss in terms of signal strength. So that's actually doable as well. We haven't really tested, but theoretically that, sh that could be doable as well by making some sacrifices, of course. More questions? Uh, there was a question there. Okay. Okay. Uh, Victor, go ahead. 
Texas. So Heather, um, you uh, you know that you know a lot of this work has been done for not your particular work, but for example, the BWRC senator was doing a lot of this stuff, and uh, Cybeam I mentioned earlier right. had a company with eighty million dollar VC funding, which actually tanked, and uh, Velocity is there now. So what? is causing this rejuvenation of the work. I don't see any fundamental changes from what I saw m many, many years ago to now that's causing uh, like three of the speakers today, four, right, three, uh, talked about 60 gigahertz. So could you give me some sense of what, what the excitement is about now that you've discovered that you didn't, or people didn't know uh, five, 10 years ago? So the exciting thing is that, first of all, um, the range, I think the range is actually an interesting idea. So um, originally, all the people think that 60 gigahertz, because of oxygen absorption, the peak, it should not be utilized. I should say that if you don't mind, you should go back to uh, about seven years ago, Bob Broderson was gave a talk right here in Microsoft Research, and he talked, he took that on head on about oxygen absorption and what sort of you know implication it has. So. That was also that also has been sort of, um, you know, it's not been an issue for a long time for that. So you did not invite me for that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you. Okay. So the I, I think um, I think one of the thing is to me is that it could be the timing that not at that time maybe the 60 gigahertz the bandwidth we don't really need that much of a bandwidth these days with all these virtual reality like Periscope we're streaming video constantly you know, to, to, the, to the network. And we really are pressured by the amount of, you know, traffic we need to support. So I think now we're really looking for capacity in all different kinds of ways, indoor or outdoor, right? So these actually, pro I mean, pressure everybody to look for alternatives to look at, you know, how do I actually boost my spectrum, uh, boost my capacity using, you know, simple economical, I mean, technologies. This may actually uh, allow us to revisit some of the past technology, but I think that's the beauty of you know, you know how demand drives the research, right? And then the thing, the other thing is, if you actually can leverage the radio to do more things like sensing or imaging, you know, this add another rich dimension on top of the existing communication, which is the right. The, the if you can reduce one device on your smartphone, why not? So I think this ample, you know, technology advantage here is the driver. So, so I think this is a panel question, but I'll just raise it and be quiet after that. The question I think is what Sandeep uh, mentioned in his last slide, really. I still need, well, I think a lot of us still need to be convinced that the capacity argument is actually valid in the sense that um, with small cells and the you know, LTE small cells or whatever. You you mentioned a number like 300 megabits per second over N range. We can get way more than that even now without 60 gig. So, uh, and then if you have small cells uh, independent of 60 gigahertz, you actually have a lot of capacity that uh, in different areas. So, I don't know what the driving scenario in, is. In all, just uh, in outdoor, can you actually get? I, I th to me, I still think the capacity thing can make sense here. So the thing is, have you have you used? Uh, I mean, Twitter. I, I use Twitter Periscope. I mean, those a lot of time you won't be able to view any video because there's the uplink upload speed is just zero, right? So I think these these applications are emerging, right? So I mean, it may not be so popular right now, but they are emerging these days. I think they can actually drive the future. Looking at how fast they develop, they may be in infancy right now, but they could actually take off, and we should be prepared for that. Right. Yeah. Uh, let's let's uh, request the speakers to be in a panel, and I think we can take this question uh, in a broader way. Uh, I would request uh, Shinyu, Sandeep, and Sharon to join us for uh, on chairs here, and, and let's direct questions to all of them. We'll just pass it around. So uh, taking the broader question, I think the question that Victor asked is that uh, 
what is the killer app for millimeter wave communications that you believe will drive the, the need for capacity that you make possible both outdoors and indoors? And, and we have some answers, but do any other speakers want to answer that question? Maybe I'll. Uh, but, but, uh, Victor, your question is really good, and I think that I've, that I've received that a lot. But what a lot of the operators will say is they, they look at just the growth rate of mobile data and then they extrapolate that out without and then you know you can project that so the first thing i think maybe i mentioned before is that 4g itself can't expand and also you're right densification even when i first presented these to qualcomm just like two years ago they had said we don't need millimeter wave we can just densify the existing cells and that's been the well that's covered a lot of the gains that we've had over the last 10 years but that also starts to run into problems because the densification itself you need to get site placement and you need to get a backhaul which if you know the economics of these of outdoor networks that becomes very expensive so uh, you know I think there is I think there is a feeling that at least in certain scenarios millimeter wave will be useful is one component of meeting capacity but there are many other techniques and you know that and how what are going to be the driving applications of what's going to continue on that curve it's probably hard to predict but on the other hand if you look back say 10 years ago and you asked what would be the driving data right now for networks you might not have been able to see that either but uh, you know, one of the things you know, could imagine something like if a lot of stuff got moved out to the cloud and we were talking about that with uh, Sharon earlier, that might be a driving factor, although maybe you don't need the latency and so on. So, I, I have a quick comment on that aspect. So uh, we talked only about capacity. Uh, are there comments on the latency aspect? Because both indoors, where you have, say, virtual reality and augmented reality with HoloLens becoming a possibility, is latency a question? And if it's a backhaul between base stations outdoors, then latency should certainly be an issue that can millimeter wave solve that. Can you guys comment on the latencies that you experience in these platforms when you um, say go from one base station to another? Or From my perspective, I think latency is mainly a problem of uh, network architecture. If you reduce like, the number of uh, gateways, middle boxes, uh, and er everything that will solve the latency problem. But I think for a millimeter wave, it's mainly solving the last hop capacity problem. That doesn't necessarily translate into latency. That's my thought. Uh, my view on the latency is I think, I think it really, it actually, it actually need, for us need to think about, given the high data rate we support like millimeter wave, what do we need to design for network protocol to really utilize that? That, that end? I think that's a rich set of questions for the network architecture design. We might have to redesign the network architecture for that purpose. But I think that's a, that's a very rich area to look into. Maybe I'll just say on the latency, if you look at the, uh, mo the best case scenario for LTE latency now is about 22 milliseconds, and that's assuming you don't have any heart retransmission. So in practice, you're looking at about error link latency, probably more like about at least 50 milliseconds in good, good scenarios. And in that case, I think actually the error link latency is probably dominant uh, because you can get, once, once you actually, if it's a wired base station, you'll you get to the gateway, even if it's like uh, hundreds of kilometers away, you can probably get there quite fast. Now, if, if, they, if there is a compelling need to push that, say, an end-to-end -end latency down, maybe in the order of like 10 milliseconds, then I think we, that would be an argument for having a new tech, uh, air link interface. But we'll also need to make some sort of commensurate changes in the network, with what we're saying. And with some of the difficult challenges there will be to push the content earlier, and I, I mentioned that. Now, the question there is, what is an algorithm, what's an application that needs both super low latency and very high bandwidth? And um, that's not obvious to me unless you're doing some kind of distributed computing across both the mobile and the cloud. And that's maybe a question I think a lot of people here will know a better answer to, like Microsoft, of whether you are trying to partition uh, sources out. But I don't think there's any application today that necessarily needs that. I'm going to let uh, audience ask questions. Otherwise, I have a list of questions. But let's start with the audience. Go ahead. Yeah, this is a question for Sharon. Uh, you were mentioning before uh, you didn't have time to talk about zero rating and the impact of uh, net neutrality and uh, whether this is a good thing or a bad thing and uh, 
giving connectivity for free uh, to people to uh, you know, some people have concerns that this may create monopolies at the application service. So they say for emerging markets, this may be a great thing. So this is for sharing about the panel in general. What, what do you think is going to happen with zero rating or sponsor-based services and net neutrality? Right. Well, first let me tell you what has happened, um, which is that uh, so in the U.S. Uh, net neutrality order, they did not. Uh, say zero. So first of all, let me make sure everyone knows what zero rating is. Sorry, <laughs> zero rating is the idea that you can get, uh, you don't get charged for the bits for certain applications um, on your data plan. So if you have a, a mobile broadband plan and it has, uh, you know, some data limitation, you know, two gigabytes a month, gigabits a month, gigabytes a month, for example, uh, but you're using Facebook. Uh, you know, the Facebook bits don't count against those two gigabits, gigabytes, sorry. Um, that would be an example of zero rating. I, the reason I, uh, I'm not trying to pick on Facebook, it's just that they've been one of the most active proponents of this idea in emerging markets in particular. And as, I, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Um, Okay, as he mentioned, um, there's pros and cons, right? The pro is, uh, you know, for people in emerging markets with very little uh, ability to pay for services, they get some data services, right? They get an experience of data services that they wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, on the other hand, if there's a home, if there is or would have been a homegrown Facebook, they won't ever see it because it will never come to pass because the users would have to pay to access the homegrown Facebook, and the you know the existing incumbent social network will will be the one that they know of. Um, that's one critique. Another one is you know it's like Facebook trying to redefine what the internet is, and we've seen all of those uh, debates happen uh, in very interesting ways over the past few months. Um, I'll go back to my original point. What did the FCC did not say zero rating is good or bad. They didn't say it was not okay either. They didn't also say it was okay. They said um, they said uh, we're not saying no, but we're going to keep watching what you're doing, industry. And if you do things that are too outrageous, we'll stop you. Okay. Uh, Europe similarly did not outlaw zero rating, but there seems to be it, it's a it, so I should say that the European uh, text I actually first received it this morning it just came out. So uh, this is based on very quick reads of you know myself and other lawyers, some of whom are in the room, some are not. But uh, I'm actually not a lawyer, sorry. Some of the lawyers within Microsoft who have looked at this, and uh, you know one uh, interpretation of what they have done is that uh, some countries in Europe, the Netherlands, for example, have said zero rating is not okay. Uh, so, sorry, Norway. Um, so, uh, if they uh, have said zero rating is not okay, can they still say that if the EU passes a unified set of regulations that everybody is supposed to follow? And so, that's also an open question of will it still be not okay in places that have said it's not okay? So, like Chile, Norway have said it's not okay. Uh, so, it, there's an open question. India was a really interesting experience in the past. Uh, I forget exactly when it was, uh, a few months back. Uh, I think in April or May of this year. Um, it, where uh, Indi the Indian telecom regulator put out a consultation asking a bunch of questions that were mostly about whether over-the-top services, meaning things like Skype as opposed to traditional voice, whether over-the-top services should be regulated. That was essentially the gist of their questioning. And it triggered a huge... Uh, outcry uh, about against zero rating, interestingly, uh, and um, you know, in some ways, you would think that'd be the last place that you'd have a backlash on zero rating. But it was actually the first place where it really blew up in a, in a market where there are many people who are unserved. So it's gone both ways. It has this, exactly the pros and cons you talked about. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, do you have a follow-up question, Pablo, or is that good? Uh, more questions from the audience. So I'm curious about. Um, so we, we, you know, we've talked about um, um, crowdsourcing and, and uh, point to point architectures as, as ways to address some of the challenges. You know, and, and sorry, I, I apologize. I'm, I'm not a not really an expert in this domain, so I apologize. If my question is worded poorly. Um, and and it seems like small cells, pico cells, right? We're talking about having access points placed very close together. And so I'm curious from a technical perspective. Are there um, are there advantages to crowdsourcing this and say you know placing access points for this type of network um, in end users' homes and you know just attaching it to their their home network connection you know maybe for low latency and and from a policy perspective so if technically that's a good thing then from a policy perspective how do we get there uh, so you can I 
That's, yeah, so you're talking about placing a base station potentially inside the user's uh, home. Uh, yeah, inside a user's home or even like, you know, encouraging users to place an antenna yeah. facing outwards to serve the street or whatever. And, yeah. And then they get maybe, you know, a kickback on their sure. internet service. So they, that actually is already done except for the kickback part. So there's a, you can get a device called a femtocell right now. And in fact, there's a, and so a femtocell you will install in a home or private re residence, but it'll run on the operator's spectrum and you can connect there and in what's called an open access model. If you, if somebody sees the signal outside the, uh, um, outside under the street, they can, they can connect. Uh, and that's obviously good for the operator because they're leveraging the, your backhaul, which is a major part of the cost, which is what I was saying. And there in fact, are actually more femtocells today than there are base stations. So they're actually wide, fairly widely uh, deployed. That being said, nobody, they don't give you a kickback, most of the uh, operators, maybe they, uh, you know, they potentially they should. And definitely, I think when you're looking at some of these technologies like millimeter wave, where the indoor coverage becomes a real problem because you can't, uh, these technologies can't get outside, but you getting inside will be impossible. It really does having a third party, leveraging third party backhaul and a third party ownership of that access point becomes much more relevant. I think you're going to see that b business model become more widely used. Uh, what you're describing is happening today, except that it's not in the millimeter waves, it's in Wi-Fi. Um, that is exactly what Wi-Fi first, ca cable's version of Wi-Fi first in the U.S., and there's a company in Europe called FON that's doing the same thing, phone. Uh, so the way the cable one in the U.S. works, um, so Comcast, for example, is doing this. They give you a home router. Uh, they've been going around the country upgrading those home routers, so it's got two SSIDs. Right? One of them is your personal one, and the other one is the one for the street. Um, and it's leveraging the backhaul that you're paying for. Now, as long as, uh, you know, as long as, A, you trust that they did the security right, so that isn't letting people into your network at home, and B, they don't charge you with a data cap so that, you know, when your neighbor, when the guy drives down your street and uses your Wi-Fi, it's affecting your bill, people are like, oh, this is great, right? And so that's actually how they're doing the Wi-Fi first, which is essentially what you're talking about. It's a crowdsourced uh, solution. So I guess my follow-up question is, is from a technical perspective, do we see... Um, home internet connections progressing to a point where they can supply the necessary backhaul bandwidth to, you know, to service these, you know, the kind of bandwidth that's necessary to have an... Right now, at least on average, the home backhaul capacity is much larger than uh, the average capacity, even if everybody opened up their ba home backhaul to it. Uh, to the note, they might not want to do that, but the average capacity would be relatively small um, on comparison. So there is enough, there's actually much more backhaul available, which is unused in some sense. And that is a good, op, you know, uh, opportunistically to use that backhaul as a potential way to uh, get around the backhaul problem, which is a big cost factor. But I, but it doesn't solve the problem in non-residential areas, right? Yeah, so yeah. like. Of course. The parts of New York City he was showing, they might be a mix, but it depends if you're in a downtown area where there's, uh, or you know, you're on a road with a big rush hour traffic and you're trying to get more capacity into that area. Yeah, so, it's not going to help on a highway or something in a suburb where there's no residence to little hand over to. Yeah, but in those areas, you can actually use millimeter wave as a backhaul, communicating between base stations just using high speed millimeter yeah. wave. On the idea of backhaul, I have a follow-up question. Are the operators incentivized to instead go for millimeter wave instead of laying new fiber between base stations as they go for new deployments of base stations? Okay. So if you look right now, there's a mix. I think uh, there was a Lucent study. It said about maybe, I think about 7% of base stations right already have millimeter wave access point. I'm not sure if it's so much. The operators have a number of factors. Um, one thing is whether they have the availability of the fiber. So in the United States, for example, AT&T and Verizon actually own fiber in certain markets, and then they would use that. And then in other areas like uh, Korea, um, fiber is very cheap, and then they would go for that. But in cases where the backhaul, where they have to lease that fiber, that can actually become extremely expensive. And that if you look at the operating expenses for uh, op cells, it's almost backhaul sometimes like 30, 50 percent of the opex. And in that case, then the millimeter wave uh, would make sense. So I think it's um, there are incentives that would uh, already push them in certain scenarios. It depends on the availability of the fiber. Thank you, Sandeep. Any other comments?
So just a, a fact, I think Google has set up some certain tests where they're trying to use millimeter wave to connect to in residential home so that, you know, set up the, the backhaul. So it's starting to happen. I think we have a question right there. Hi, uh, this question for the three professors. Um, when you're doing your uh, millimeter wave research, what do you desire the industry to participate? I mean, can, how can the industry help or what you hope the industry can do that would make uh, your research uh, more um, better or more productive? Aside from giving us money? <laughs> oh, besides giving you money, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think now is basically um, providing suitable platforms because a lot of time for academia to develop these platforms, which we're trying to do now, is they take time, they take money. We have to apply for a very large NSF grant in order to supply that. We did that. Um, but I, I think that providing us the, the right platform, a powerful reconfigure platform, for example, Sora, and that would definitely speed up the process. I think now it's very difficult to developing or testing or verifying our protocols because we just don't have suitable hardware. And a lot of industry, they just don't want to give it to us because they're startups and they're just, you know, they're using this to, um, to, to get their own market share. So it's very difficult for us to ask them to, for those platform. But if Microsoft can support these, that would be awesome. Same answer as Heather. Actually, I also know there are a lot of uh, 60 years hardware platform, for example, from uh, one from Qualcomm. Um, they have the capability, for example, of op operating on the 60 years band and running the Azure 2011 AD protocol, but they are just opening up it as completely a black box. We can get nothing useful out of it. If we can get a little bit of information, like uh, even receive the signal strength, that will actually speed up a lot of research. But right now, we don't have them yet. Yeah, I completely agree. In addition um, to the need for a platform, the other thing as I'm hoping maybe a company like Microsoft could do is for people at least at my layer more in the fit I and Mac, may try to understand, work with them to understand how the network and applications would um, work and because and also from other industrial partners if you like AT&T which would know the actual realistic economics of networking I think that what that to least to me is a bit of a mystery and that's where I think we could get a lot of collaboration at least particularly in this room I have another questions for the three professors <laughs> um, so all of you choose to do uh, to pick on working a uh, minimal wave as the areas to work on. But the title of this uh, section is 5G. Can you comment about other 5G technologies? Uh, like what I heard about, like massive MIMO, distributed MIMO, densification, or even codification. Um, I agree that we did not uh, get all speakers on all those technologies. But I, I, I think uh, we have Paul here, who's uh, <laughs> Talking to all the 5G folks, so I'm going to defer the question to Paul as to like where those technologies stand. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. In the last panel session, I said something about organized chaos, um, and I guess I, I mean I don't really know how to answer the question. I think it's 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 the right question. The question I was going to ask the panel actually was in all this chaos of multiple technologies, what needs to happen for them to get rationalized into something that can be a general, uh, an actual benefit to the business ecosystem and to the sort of global connectivity ecosystem and get out of the mode of sort of research projects. I can't answer the all technologies question uh, at this point myself, so. So my partial answer is I think important thing is as we add more technology, more radio technology on top of each other, they're all going to integrate into smart hall, how they actually interact with each other. What time, what do you use? Do you use them simultaneously? Do you use it alternatively? I think that's a good question to ask. Even for 60 gigahertz or millimeter wave, it will actually provide you capacity, but it won't provide you continuous connectivity. There will be time that you are just in a very awkward location that there's no flexion will reach you, you're blocking all the waves, in that way you fall back to LTE or fall back to Wi-Fi. And you can also leverage LTE to do coordination for you 
in a sense. So how do these technologies interact with each other? I think that's another interesting question among that for 5G or 7, 8, 9. Uh, thank you, Heather. I, I, I think a big comment that I have on 5G is that all the technologies that you're considering at this point, uh, the economic benefits have not been clearly marked out. So I think those will decide which technologies sort of end up taking off. So they're still in prototype mode and, and debate mode for, from my understanding. Is that correct, Sharon? Um, I, I think that the... Um, you know, it's very interesting what drives a cellular operator to deploy a new generation of technology at all. Why would they do it at all? Um, you know, uh, because it's just more more expense for them. It's a big investment, and it, it, you know, are they going to get more revenue, right? So, you know, one theory. So, for example, if you go back to 4G, why did Verizon come out in the U.S. way ahead in 4G? You know, what made them come out? You know, let's do LTE. Let's really drive it. Let's advertise it. Let's market it. Uh, you know, one theory is that AT&T had an exclusive on the iPhone and they were killing Verizon. <laughs> and that's what drove AT uh, Verizon to say, let me differentiate my network and have something that I can market and brand and, you know, it'll be the fast network and they'll have the nice phone and I'll have the fast network. Um, so that's why I came back to the sort of competition policy issue. The economics are hugely important. I, I you know, I admire what you're doing with 60 gigahertz because I completely agree with you that if you don't have to pay for the spectrum, you know, it costs a lot less. Uh, so, you know, and it also opens up other models of how, uh, you know, non-traditional players can enter the space. Uh, but, um, you know, is there a desire to do it? I mean, in the past, what's usually happened is that, uh, you know, each generation there was some big technological advance, you know, we went from analog to digital, and then we went from digital to internet, basically, uh, right? From, from circuit to packet, if you will. Um, so this time around, I think it's a little less clear because we already went to packet. And once we're at packet, then it becomes better, faster, cheaper, just like wired networks, right? I've got, I can do the internet. Now the question is, you know, can I do it faster? You know, is there, first of all, what's the trajectory of actual demand for that? You know, we, we, but it's always gone like this, but that doesn't necessarily mean it always will. Most likely, yes, but you know, we don't know. Uh, and the second is, if if people do want better, faster, cheaper, how do how do I as an operator distinguish myself so that I can make more money? And what I see happening is the conversation is, I want to be the service provider because that's where I'm going to make more money. I don't make money by selling bits, you know. And I think one of two things will happen: either some operator out there who will likely be one of those little disruptive ones if they don't get merged out of existence, some operator out there will say, actually, I can make money by being really good and fast and cheap, and I have a really dumb pipe but it's really cheap and people will buy it and they will like it and they will come to me and I will make money. And the other extreme is uh, actually I make money because I have some unique service that people have to come to my network to get. Right, and um, and to do that, I have a very tightly integrated network where I have you know all all of the services are in my network, close to my user, with low latency, and I can do all sorts of things that other people can't do. And you hear a lot of that discussion in five G. That's that's sort of, but but it's I think Sandeep and I were talking about it at lunch. You know, it's not super clear exactly what those apps would be that would fall into that profile, but uh, you know they could exist. So. Um. Question and then we can come back to. It. No, go ahead. Um, I was going to comment on on a different topic than millimeter wave. Although I'm I'm very close to this area, I love it and I think um, spectrum offload in any parts of the spectrum is going to really drive um, utilization of of 60 gigahertz. The one that I have that basically. Uh, kept me up uh, all night and, and sometimes is how do you optimize radio resources for over the top? I had a reason why I was looking at that problem and I went and approached some operators and infrastructure vendors anywhere from Vodafone uh, to Samsung and Ericsson and so on. So, and they all kind of like, it's like a deer with a headlight shine in their, in their face. And the reason was why I was looking at it because I, you know, I work for Skype and Skype and Sky for Business is an over-the-top application. It's very demanding on the radio resources for the cellular network. And it's interesting, and the comment as related to 5G in general, that all of the ones I asked independently said, oh, this is a topic for 5G. So this is a comment. It's not really a question. If you have a comment on this, I would really like to understand your views on that. Um, maybe I'm going to 
if I can answer back, we'll put the question back to you, because even within the 4G, they made a lot of uh, infrastructure changes in the Evolve Packet Core. As you might know, at the gateway, you can offer, theoretically, the operator can uh, provide quality of service. You can open a bearer with a specific quality of service, and then, in principle, the operator could provide, open that up and say, okay, to Skype, if you want, you, you can go along this uh, path, and then, you know, we'll change the scheduling decisions. Of course, they'd probably have to reimburse. Skype would have to pay for that or something, and maybe gets into network neutrality. But generally, those, there's a huge infrastructure in that, but it's never used, and everything is just going over best effort. Effort. So I just kind of comment on that. You're right. There is a huge infrastructure out there that relies quite a bit on deep packet inspection. And what happens every time we have an upgrade, a software upgrade, it breaks the <laughs> DPI. So that's one of the reasons why it's not fully used. To give you an example, going from Link 2013 to Sky for Business, which is our new product, all Wi-Fi wireless controllers that are using deep packet inf inspection, Cisco, Aruba, Miru, they're all broke. So, <laughs> you know, and you can imagine what the escalations were like. But in any, any point, my, my point is, uh, actually operators fully recognize this, and we are, I'm in deep discussions with these operators to how do we do this without violating net neutrality. Good luck with that, right, Sharon? I mean, it's like, but, but I, I think if, if there are thoughts that come to mind, I, I definitely would like to engage. Uh, Sorry, what was your last? Uh, um, if there are thoughts that come to mind on how you optimize the radio resources for like over-the-top applications, I feel like it's uh, not. It's less a technical question because we understand, at least in academia, maybe too much on quality of service, and the, even the network standards have already put in a lot of standard support for that. And it seems like most of it is a business, and maybe I'm wrong, that, that, that is a business issue of getting, a, you know, getting an arrangement with a particular service prov content provider to actually utilize the mechanisms to, you know, you know target that. But maybe I don't, I don't see a, I don't see a technical barrier to you know, providing pre preferential service because, you know, we know about scheduling policies. We know about how to mark those and the whole network infrastructure. So just quick, uh, 10 seconds and I will stop here because I, I'm sorry I've taken a lot of that time at the end. This is, it, it takes Skype, for example, or, or WhatsApp or what have you. You have VoIP, you have, some of them have uh, video, so on and so forth. It's not a matter of knowing it's Skype by doing some deep packet inspection and prioritizing that. You have to know the modality and these modalities like VoIP has different performance and you need different power control and you need different prioritization than video, than uh, app sharing, than content sharing. This is what actually we were looking for. It's a bit more specific, I suppose. But I, I also see your point that there's a lot of literature out there that one has to look at. I, Thanks. I, I, I think <laughs> what he's talking about, are these are the UCI codes, or QCI codes, or there, there's a name for the codes, oh, but yeah, Q, yeah, QCI. QCI and LTE, that, uh, that um, uh, in other words, that, to your point about the modalities, Amr, you know, we, the phone would tell the network, here's what I'm doing, and this is the kind of performance that I need, and there is nothing in net neutrality that prevents that. What it does prevent, and in fact, there's nothing in net neutrality that says that a, an ISP can't manage their network and decide to make VoIP packets go ahead of video packets if they want to. What it does say is they can't require payment for it. And I think that's where, that's yeah. the challenge is, I think what, what, what Sandeep is saying is the challenge is the business model, not the technology. The technology exists yeah. in order for the OTT to tell the network, this is what I need, the challenge, but, but you're not agreeing with me. No. <laughs> no I, I, <laughs> uh, yeah, let's 30. take this question <laughs> offline at this point. But uh, let's thank our speakers for their talks and questions. Thank you so much. And they'll be available offline if you have more questions. Thanks again.